Okay. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to to this keynote session, um, and with uh, Sukmani Korana, and I will shortly introduce her before before the talk. Uh, Sukmani Korana is associate professor uh, and science fellow in the School of Arts and Media at the University of New South Wales, Australia. Her research explores media diversity, multi-platform refugee narratives, and the politics of empathy and affect. Uh, in her work, she has collaborated with media and arts organizations, young people, and government agencies on projects that uh, aim to benefit diverse communities, looking at art interventions and also building and thinking decolonial approaches. On the whole, her research aims at creating a broader awareness about the lives of asylum seekers and refugees and diasporic communities and contribute to the capacity building of, of migrant communities. And she has published widely on media studies journals and her latest book, we see over here, uh, from 2022 is titled Mediated Emotions of Migration, Reclaiming Affect for Agency. And today, uh, her talk is about belonging as reciprocal affect towards centering agency in migrant and refugee-led digital media artifacts. So, Sukmani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karuna, for that kind introduction. Um, the reason I'm starting with a slide about my book is because it's not just promoting my book. Um, it is scene setting for my talk. Um, it's quite relevant for this conference because the book has singled out three emotions, aspiration, belonging, and empathy, which I refer to in this book as ambivalent emotions. And what I mean by that is that they're not the emotions that are, have negative connotations and are associated with migration. There's plenty written about them, like fear and hatred. I'm more interested in the ones that are somewhere in between that probably had radical or progressive beginnings like empathy, but that often got appropriated by the other side of politics um, and have kind of lost the way. So I'm looking at instances, mediated instances, where those emotions of social change can still be reclaimed. So it is a, it is a hopeful book, um, and that's why I think um, it is important that I talk about it very briefly at this conference. It's also interesting being the final keynote because I've had a chance to reflect on everything, a, a number of sessions that I've attended, um, and including the Refugee Film Festival, and see resonances across national contexts in terms of not just policy, but in terms of spaces of resistance. So I'll refer where possible to you know, what I've heard and try to make connections uh, throughout my talk today. Now, what I'm going to talk about primarily is a project that I did a few years ago. This is pre-COVID, uh, but some of the problems that came up have amplified in the wake of COVID. It was a project situated in southwest Sydney, um, which is a fairly marginalized part of uh, Sydney. If you look at the two maps here, on the left-hand side, you've got the... COVID map, and on the right-hand side, you've got the new growth area map of the same region. And I'll explain it in a minute. So Liverpool, this is not Liverpool in the UK, this is Liverpool in, um, in Sydney, in the state of New South Wales, is about 25 kilometers from the CBD towards the southwest. It's a fairly working class area, so in some ways similar to Liverpool in the UK, but also a place which has had various waves of migration, starting with when Australia used to accept refugees, not send them to offshore detention centres, so Eastern European migrants, Vietnamese migrants, uh, subsequent waves of Indian and Chinese migrants, um, and more recently, um, refugees from the Middle East and from Africa as well. So it would be what would be classified as a super diverse area, not an ethnic enclave, a super diverse in the same way that somewhere, somewhere like Rye Lane in London might be, where there is no single ethnicity that dominates, um, but still quite uh, socioeconomically deprived and has a large youth population. Now, what happened during COVID is that 
um, a number of areas of Sydney were considered hotspots. So even though during the Delta outbreak, the virus came from the affluent eastern suburbs because those are the people that were privileged and able to travel, but it was the southwestern suburbs where most of the essential workers are located, where the virus spread more, um, more virulently, I suppose, um, and which were under harsh lockdown. Um, and so there was a lot of commentary in the media and from the people living in these suburbs about how there was, uh, there was you know, almost you know, different kinds of rules being imposed there which were, which were not necessary. There was at some stage even um, you know, police and army uh, patrolling the area. And Liverpool was obviously one of the suburbs where this was happening. On the other side, the map indicates that this is a new growth area. So the state government is trying to promote three centers of the city. They're trying to move out of the center of the city, which is quite uh, crowded. They're trying to promote two other centers, one's in Parramatta, which is in the west, and trying to move government offices and private companies out there. And Liverpool um, is the third one, um, although the growth is very, very steady, and um, there are fears of gentrification, there are fears that might di displace the original population. Um, but also there is a, an airport, a new airport being developed in, near Liverpool in a, an area called Badgeries Creek, which um, they speculate would need, lead to more growth there. So there's several parallel narratives happening um, in this area, so it's, it's ripe for interesting projects. Um, and I'll refer to some of those in my talk today. Now, this talk is based on the final chapter of my new book, uh, which aims to advance our understanding of belonging and its affective dimensions expressed through migrant and refugee-centered digital media artifacts. It begins by reflecting on belonging as a feeling of our times, albeit a political one that attempts to move past a superficial libertarian focus on harmony in new migrant communities. Instead, through the case study of a recent migrant community project with a creative outcome based in Southwest Sydney, I examine what belonging looks and feels like when the focus is on co-creating cultural safety through approaches that favor reciprocity and creative agency. This lens on belonging also refer reverses the discursive construction of new migrants as those requiring integration initiatives to fit in or of certain others in need of de-radicalization. Instead, it asks, what will make them feel safe enough to invest in local and national communities? This is not to discount the value of resettlement programs in English language classes. Rather, the focus here is on augmenting existing programs with projects that decenter the majority community and make space for cultural belonging to emerge in a reci reciprocal manner. So what I highlight here is the following aspects of belonging. First, it is more affective, sorry, it is more effective than identity as a point of solidarity in the 21st century. And sec secondly, it needs to be seen as a reciprocal affect and not just as an individual feeling to make solidarity possible. And thirdly, its manifestation, the local and or creative, is a way to ground and enable reciprocal affect reconceptualize and co-create belonging that is more culturally mobile while being safe. So a little bit about how I started working on this. Um, when I was writing this paper, I was nestled in a corner of the level two open space near the lifts at the University of Wollongong Southwest Sydney campus that is now nearly three years old. While trawling through the literature on belonging, I heard one male student at the escalator calling out to his friend on the other side of the closing doors. I love you, bro. He stretched out his right arm to stop the door as his um, colleague uttered, love you too. This semester has been good because of you. I'm floored by this expression of homosocial affection, which I barely see in a lot of masculine Anglo contexts, such as sections of my workplace. Beyond the surprising nature and context of this particular articulation, I wonder about whether the students at this campus felt a sense of belonging there. <clears throat> it was a vertical campus with, without any bars and cafes. And then I marveled at the fact that in less than three years, this part of Sydney had become such a source of belonging for my own first-generation migrant academic self. For me, this specific sense of feeling at home in the Liverpool CBD was far from instantaneous. It was a, it was a gradual getting to know the streets and its residents, frequenting ethnic grocers and the local Westfield shopping centre, befriending security guards at the campus as well as powerful counsellors that got me here without any particular goal in sight. 
My first encounter there was one rife with ambivalence, as prior to this I had never lived or worked in an area with a significant proportion of working class people of color. Therefore, I had to persist with the ambivalence to see its potential for manifesting a less obvious form of belonging. <clears throat> I focus in this talk on a project situated in the city of Liverpool due to its fast-growing diverse youth population. As per the latest census data, this local government area is highly diverse with ancestral backgrounds from Italy, India, Lebanon, Vietnam, and China, among others. According to the Liverpool Youth Strategy, Liverpool's population of young people is consistently higher than Greater Sydney, and about 31% were born overseas. Prior to the global COVID-19 crisis, Liverpool was profiled as a hub of urban and employment growth due to land release, redevelopment, and the building of a new airport. Like the rest of the nation and the world, the impact of global recession has been felt and is being felt in Liverpool and by its existing diverse migrant communities, especially the youth. Um, while the project here was undertaken prior to the pandemic, it was vested in fostering belonging and intercultural networks among youth. Both of these objectives are likely to be even more significant in the socioeconomic recovery of this region, which was deemed an LGA of concern due to high rate of infections during the 2021 lockdown. <coughs> According to Bissell um, and others in the introduction of their book, Social Beings, Future Belongings, Reimagining the Social, belonging is both a feeling and a set of practices. Um, they argue that the potential of belonging is in its productive ambiguity. Perhaps this can be understood as affect in that it is a situational and embodied feeling that may not be easy to articulate and name as a clear-cut emotion. When belonging is ascribed the taxonomy of nationality or the naturalness of a predetermined emotion associated with primordial identity, it becomes limiting and limited. Uh, Bissell and others also use the work of Wright and Amin to suggest that belonging is now provisional and it will be useful to consider how ethical and political implications change when we see belonging as referring to an event or an everyday encounter. This then becomes something that is not predetermined, but is coming into being through affective encounters and acting in responsive ways. So what I do here is use this notion of a sort of rebirthing of belonging as productive rather than predetermined, as affective rather than definitive, and as reciprocal rather than individualistic, to understand how it helps create a safe space um, in this project. Such a reconceptualization and recentering of belonging is essential to move the focus away from identity and integration in the official discourses and everyday practices around multiculturalism in immigrant settler societies like Australia. This is not to say that these terms have no value in particular contexts. For instance, identity politics can be generative and has been generative in anti-racism struggles. Um, and integration can be useful in advocating for cultural maintenance amongst migrant groups. However, this talk begins with an overview of the academic literature of belonging to make a case for its particular value in contemporary multicultural suburbs. And then I talk about the case study and its findings. Uh, what I contend here is that the most important reason to privilege the language of belonging and to attempt to see it as an affect, which is both individual and collective, is that it is agency endowing to migrants themselves. What that means is that enables them to feel and articulate their own identity instead of being at the receiving end of the language of objectification, which is often employed by the state or by mainstream discourses. Um, in a 2009 document called Australia Settlement Services for Migrants and Refugees, um, they outlined the federal government's Living in Harmony program. While this is not classified as a settlement service, it describes a, a key ingredient of their plan for integrating migrants and fostering social cohesion. Social cohesion itself is seen to come through the promotion of respect, participation, a sense of belonging, and Australian values. Now, despite clearly mentioning a sense of belonging as integral to facilitating social cohesion, 
The close ending of this with Australian values makes such belonging a conditional object. In other words, the belonging seen as contributing so to social cohesion has to be done on the terms of the majority community. In a critique of the official use of social cohesion, Chris Ho argues that since the 2000s, it marks a shift in multicultural policy from social justice in the 1970s and 80s to productive diversity in the 1980s and 90s. Now, this move is significant for the reconceptualization of belonging here because the focus on harmony has been depoliticizing and incapable of addressing the hard issues of racism and inequality. In order to begin to address these in a socio-political climate that is averse to the language of identity, belonging, I'm arguing, poses as a useful tool that centers the concern of migrants without threatening the legitimacy of the nation state as a place to claim belonging to. It is only when we flip the dynamic of centering the majority community that we can begin to see the cultural and creative practices of migrants and refugees as enabling of their own belonging and as central to the national canon rather than token signifiers within it. Now, this sentiment was also expressed in the audience feedback received at the screening of the short films that were made as part of the project explored um, in this talk. As you can see from one of the audience respondents here, they see um, they were concerned that uh, Sydney is seen as a creative hub only in certain parts, whereas the western and southwestern part um, is not seen as something which generates creativity or cultural expression, and there is a need to de-link those two ideas. Such a response also maps the idea of who is seen as belonging and who is excluded onto a literal geography of the city of Sydney. This is important because belonging is often articulated in national terms when its exclusions play out in the everyday lives of migrants at a local level. So I will attempt to articulate how the fostering of belonging can be localized as well. <clears throat> um, other scholars who tease out the origins of belonging um, say the English word belonging is a fortuitous compound of being and longing, of existential and romantic imaginary significations and association, shaped and configured in multiple ways by the international system of nationalism as simultaneously a political and a cultural ordering principle. It raises questions about cultural, sociological, and political transformative processes and their impact on imagined and real boundaries. Um, while this definition brings the affective aspects of belonging in the context of a changing geopolitical landscape to the foreground, there are concerns raised about where and how belonging ought to be tethered. They ask that if glo globality isn't a good enough emotional substitute for nationality, can a multicultural local generate that kind of emotional attachment? Now, based on these theories, they conclude that belonging requires territorial and historical fixity. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, this talk is uh, based on the idea that local multicultural belonging can be a source of affective attachment. At the same time, local belonging, as I will elaborate in the case study, is also a side of cultural mobility and it can be generative of a kind of safety that is a signifier of concreteness. Now, academic literature on belonging has been emerging since the 1990s, and it attempts to distinguish it from um, identity are ongoing. Um, Salapanis argues that the two terms should not be conflated because belonging is an abstract relational concept compared to identity's more categor categorical individualistic bent. If belonging is to be reconceptualized as a pluralistic and affective sense of being with diverse others, then it must be pushed beyond the conceptual confines of identity. When considered in this way, it is possible to see belonging as a gradual process rather than giving birth, uh, that something that is given at birth or via an official document. In her work on the politics of belonging, Yuval Davis posits that for most people today, social and cultural citizenship and the belonging that arises um, for most people today social uh, is gradual, multi-clared, and included attachment to multiple collectivities. She adds that this is of consequence because it impacts people's access to a variety of social, economic, and political res resources. 
What this means is that contemporary attempts to understand belonging as affect must contend with its multifarious attachments as well as exclusions. Bringing the focus back to migrants and refugees, there is a degree of consensus that their sense of belonging is divided between at least two national entities and what they represent. In work with immigrant populations in the southwest city in the US, Brettel concluded that they have a bifocality of outlooks and dual sense of belonging. He asked that while many choose to become naturalized American re citizens for pragmatic reasons, <coughs> Their cultural belonging is still strongly rooted in their place of birth, and hence their identities are shaped by both. While the sort of political belonging that is bestowed by public institutions and the law is an important dimension of belonging for migrants, what I'm more interested in here is the everyday unfolding and becoming of belonging for this group. In this sense, then, belonging is to be seen as an affect that comes about in a relational setting, and is most effective with a high degree of reciprocity. Um, in her work with Vietnamese Australian communities in their ordinary settings, Caitlin Nunn suggests that belonging is inherently re relational, negotiated through processes of seeking and granting, asserting and rejecting, in which individuals and groups have varying degrees of agency. When we move across ethnic groups in these settings, other considerations come to light. The dual sense of belonging is not adequate to forge connections with those not of the majority community or one's own ethno-linguistic group, uh, but those with one whom shares a recent migrant status. So um, it's really important moving forward in reconceptualizing belonging uh, to also consider how belonging can be about forging solidarities with other multicultural populations in the local. Um, and this is despite the critiques of the multicultural and uh, discourses in the European context. Um, in the Australian context, it's clear that it, the multicultural people themselves see it as of value and enables, it to, enables them to claim belonging um, to the nation that they're living in. So, <clears throat> is this working? Moving on to the project itself, and I'll play a clip of one of the films in a bit. Um, now, on migrant community projects and approaches, uh, projects that facilitate creative storytelling or civic participation in migrant communities in diverse urban areas of Sydney and other places have been going on and have gained momentum since the early 2000s. According to Salazar, who partnered with community organizations to undertake projects of this kind in the suburb of Parramatta, which I talked about earlier in the western suburbs, endeavors of this kind have been found to be both effective and empowering in each local context leading to community leadership, social cultural inclusion, and as an interface for intergenerational cultural dialogue. Uh, one of the audience respondents for the project on which this talk is based also highlighted the anti-racism dimension as being more profound than other kinds of enterprises that claim to improve inclusion. They say, I really want to thank you for anyone and anyone who contributes to the less heard voices to be heard, it is easy to talk about inclusion, anti-racism, and multiculturality in expensive suits and dresses in huge conference rooms. However, we need to roll up our sleeves and talk to these others, to listen to their stories, to fund their films, to bring them on the platform. This needs to continue until everyone is on the platform and the binaries of us-them are weakened. Therefore, projects that aim to empower marginalized communities such as migrant and refugee youth in disadvantaged areas also have the benefit of increasing the exposure of the majority community to these voices and stories. Now, these multi-pronged benefits, however, are not a given. They're highly dependent on certain kinds of processes and facilitation approaches that are participatory in nature. Um, through their own participatory media project, Gifford and others report that they learned that giving young people space to represent who they are is not a straightforward process. They elaborate, providing space to speak does not mean that they will easily appropriate that space, <clears throat> especially for recently arrived young people with refugee backgrounds. Participatory approaches do not necessarily encourage agency. In some ways, some projects may argue, require a degree of structure to facilitate the personal and creative agency of the participants. Now, this is important to remember, especially in light of you know, the, the increase in core design approaches and core research with youth participants. When you're working with marginalized youth, 
it's really important to remember that it's not just about giving agency that looks like complete blue sky thinking. It's also important to kind of guide them along the way. Um, I will give you a brief overview of the project and the methods um, and then play this clip. In response to the growing diversity in Liverpool and other parts of Sydney, the relevant city councils, multicultural service organisations in the area, as well as community arts initiatives are endeavouring to empower marginalised groups. This often takes the form of community gardens, food tours, catering startups, art and craft stalls and digital storytelling workshops. While these workshops have been found to be effective, the material is rarely seen outside of the context in which it is produced, and there is no evaluation of its impact. Therefore, this project called Passage Stories of Migration and Belonging aimed to address these gaps by partnering university students with new migrant refugee participants and having a community-wide launch of their productions, and also conducting an evaluation on the basis of feedback obtained from participants, facilitators, and the screening audience. Funding for this project was obtained from the university's competitive community engagement grant scheme, whose aim is to facilitate partnerships with local communities. Um, the project was the first of its kind in southwest Sydney to entail a collaboration between a university, a community arts and media organization, which is Curious Works, and a multicultural community organization, which is Settlement Services International. Um, while there have been many partnerships with universities in this area, um, it's not taken place in southwest Sydney. Um, in November 2018, three teams of two participants each were recruited by myself and the SSI coordinator. At the first workshop, the Curious Works facilitators introduced team building and filmmaking concepts. A, a participant information pack was circulated and consent forms were signed and collected. For the second workshop, I, as the conceptual project leader, delivered material on cities, migration and belonging. This was to assist the team to think about relevant ideas and possible stories over the break. And at the third and final workshop, the mentors, mentors from Curious Works in the university checked in with the teams on the ideas developed over the break. Um, and then they delivered a material on filmmaking basics and the pairs begin storytelling and storyboarding so that the production can begin. Um, at the final workshop, the teams began to finalize their stories, prepare detailed timelines for production and post-production. Over the subsequent month, they shot their stories at various locations around southwest Sydney. The films were then edited by Curious Works mentors at their studio and approved for screening by the project team in March. A screening event was then held at the university's Liverpool campus. It was open to the public and had near full attendance and constructive feedback via online interaction and audience questionnaires. The films were also invited to be screened at the big screen in the main mall in the council area for two weeks in April, and they're still currently available online via Vimeo. According to the facilitators, it is commendable that all three teams successfully completed the workshop and produced um, good quality short films for screening and online distribution, as such projects usually have a high rate of attrition. And then I can talk a little bit more about how we uh, created cultural safety in the project. So everyone ready for a quick screening of one of the three films? Yes, great. it was different, like you didn't even think about racism because you're living around people who look like you. So I remember going to New Zealand, um, I had to change my accent because people couldn't understand me and they had to go, hello, how are you? And like you have to speak slowly. They think that I wasn't able to understand, but I could understand, you know, and it kind of like feel you have to change yourself at that moment to be adapt to adapt. Well, 
loaded completely. Now that film was one of the most challenging ones to make, um, or the team had the most issues because um, it was there were intergenerational issues: the young um, African Australian uh, student and the Greek um, Australian migrant. They just were struggling to be on the same page about what their definition of belonging was, and they decided to do, to in, you know interview members of their own family to get around that kind of uh, difference that they had. And it ended, ended up being one of the best films. Um, of the three. Now, feedback from participants was sought via a standard survey undertaken by Curious Works that were shared with all the project partners and one-on-one -on -one audio recorded interviews that I conducted. In addition to this, 10 members of the audience of about 50 responded to a detailed qualitative interview sent via email after the public screening. I also sought feedback from the workshop facilitators and the SSI coordinator. So in this section, I will consider these responses um, to contribute to the project of reconceptualizing belonging that I outlined earlier. And all respondents have been de-identified. The first theme is belonging as process. All six participants reported having learned from the project and also mentioned that it contributed to and helped develop their prior understanding of belonging. According to respondent Y, who is a university student and whose family migrated from Iraq five years ago, belonging was described as a process of gradual transitions. They say, I found it very difficult to belong to this country, and I'm actually still in my belonging process. However, this project was like an eye-opening experience for me as I found out that everyone has a belonging story, and belonging sometimes does not really mean that you were born somewhere and you belonged to it. It is a much bigger concept than it looks. In this way, participants comment, commence the journey of thinking of and feeling belonging is something that could occur beyond country of birth affiliation. A couple of team members also spoke of how the project itself gave them access to networks that assisted in their understanding of belonging in the context of migration. According to respondent M, who is a second-generation migrant from Greece, all members of the project contributed life stories and were happy to get to know each other, thus making the experience much more rewarding. I'm fortunate to have made some very special friends, and my experiences during the project have enriched my own life knowledge of migration and belonging. This testimony also speaks to the theme of belonging as an affect conducive to safety and meaning, uh, which I'll explore further. There was only one international student participating in the project, and for them it was especially beneficial in terms of learning about various kinds of migrants to Australia. Participant T also reported being keen to spread the word, thereby touching upon the aspect of belonging that lends itself to establishing an emotional community of advocacy <coughs> on particular issues. They said, I feel more connected to other individuals, especially refugees and migrants, as I understand more about their struggles entering a new country. By sharing the creatives from our project, I'm able to get the message across friends in my networks, and I'm eager to have a chat with anyone interested in it. I think by spreading the work, it will result in some changes finally in terms of behaviors, perspectives, and government policies. Along similar lines, one of the audience respondents also expressed interest in the advocacy angle of the expression of affective belonging and how it has historical precedence. They said, 
I believe in being heard and speaking out. There was a time in America when buses were segregated to black and white parts, and Rosa Parks refused to give her seat up to a white passenger, and that started something. So making such films, raising awareness and sharing that it's okay to be different, it's fine to look different, we can all cohabit peacefully, can lead to change socially and politically. Now, the contribution of cultural production to the feeling of belonging for old and new migrants and its capacity for intercultural understanding is thereby, thereby understood by these respondents and participants as a gradual but vital process. The second theme that emerged was the creation of safe space. In the responses and feedback obtained from the project, um, it was also indicated that uh, creating a safe space is very important, and the facilitation process aided in this. They suggest that this is reliant on what I identify as the three core principles for safe space creation, which is conducive to storytelling and creative mediation, and these are respect, relatability, and reciprocity. For starters, with regards to the workshop approach itself, participant Etch commented that through the Curious Works evaluation, the space was always safe and I always felt comfortable to speak up. Loved working with the facilitators. This response is indicative of the significance of acceptance for a feeling of safety and thereby affective belonging. According to one of the audience responses, this connection to belonging was evident in the films themselves. Belonging means being accepted, safe, and loved in a community of loved ones, kin, and friends. Yes, the film showed how migrants could feel unbelonged and belonged at the same time by different groups of people. Acceptance, in turn, is linked to feeling trusted and respected by facilitators and project participants. This means that as one of the cornerstones of creating a safe space for affective belonging, respect needs to be established, communicated, and felt from the outset. In a commentary for the Curious Works evaluation, participant M noted this, the value of this feeling. They said, the faith and trust shown by fellow members in telling their heartfelt and often emotional stories is something that I will hold dear and has also enabled me to have a stronger awareness of the varying differences and difficulties often faced by immigrants during a harrowing experience. Similarly, participant T indicated that she felt welcomed and it was easy to mingle with other project members. She also highlighted the pairing process as effective as I had a chance to discuss and develop ideas in deeper length with my partner. In my phone interview with this participant, she mentioned that the safe space was primarily enabled by having participants with relatable experiences. She added this was a contrast to her tutorial groups at the main campus, which mainly consisted of domestic Anglo students. This observation makes it imperative to point out that while this was not part of the design of the projects, all six participants ended up being female identifying and first or second generation migrants with three from refugee backgrounds. Whether a safe space would have to be facilitated differently in a larger project consisting of team members with more varied experiences or ethnic origins is something that I guess can be explored in other research. <clears throat> Now, in addition to respect and relatability, respondents also suggested that reciprocity of effort was present and vital to creating an environment that was safe and conducive to belonging. In my face-to-face -face interview with her, participant M commented that she felt that the group worked because of listening. In other words, there was mutual respect for each other's stories and backgrounds and therefore a degree of listening reciprocity when experiences or ideas were being shared. This is similar to the finding of the focus groups conducted by Will among South Sudanese communities in Canberra. She found that for the men in this cohort, it was important for the wider Australian community to get to know them. This was because by learning to know each other, a two-way integration, a common belonging may develop where all members of the society acknowledge and see the need for each other. Therefore, this notion of reciprocity is key to not only establishing a safe space in a small-scale project, but appears to be applicable to the wider context of migration wherein integration means reciprocal effort and this results in belonging. And the final theme to emerge from the evaluations was uh, having similar yet different experiences. Now, despite the above mentioned comment about relatable experiences, some participants mentioned that there were also notable differences among them and this was not a barrier to participation. 
For instance, participant H noted, I got to work with my mum, which was special. I also got to work with young artists, which is always special. We're also like-minded yet different. It was nice to be in a room with different people who share similarities and differences. In a similar way, participant K remarked on the similarities existing alongside difference. They said, this workshop has impacted me in a variety of ways. Most importantly, it made me understand other people's struggle and suffering and how we can all be so different yet similar. These responses echo research on solidarity theory, um, which is obviously from Karuna's work that promotes reflective solidarity as a space that allows the exploration and articulation of differences while providing an inclusive understanding of we. Finally, the audience responses to a question about their understanding of definition of belonging suggest that the films and the accompanying introduction from participants aided in their reconceptualizing of belonging. For example, one of them wrote, belonging means <clears throat> being connected with, uh, being, con being connected to whoever is my family or friends at this moment, being free to explore the environment I live in. The films confirmed my idea that belonging does not have to be from your birth family or culture or birthplace, but having freedom to be yourself with who and where you are. Now, this response demonstrates both cultural safety and intercultural mobility, status, statuses and movement as being integral to adjusting our notion of affective belonging in global migratory context. So to conclude, um, in this talk, the notion of belonging in relation to migration, um, I've said that it's received attention since the 1990s. It's not a new idea. Those writing on it have also attempted to distinguish it from identity as it, it is considered to be more relational and less definitive. In addition to providing an overview of how belonging has been theorized and endowed with more agency from migrants themselves, I have attempted to reconceptualize it so that its affective and iterative dimensions are foregrounded. The case study of a small-scale migrant-centered community project located in the diverse satellite city of Liverpool, Australia, assists with this reconceptualization. The feedback from the participants' screening event, audience and partner organizations for the project yielded three principles of belonging, namely belonging as process, the creation of safe spaces, and the emphasis on similarities, as well as differences to forge reflective solidarities. For future research on belonging, I argue that these principles could, could also be trialed in the broader context of multiculturalism in Australia and comparable immigrant nations in the global north. That is, it is worthwhile examining further whether a sense of cultural safety and reciprocity from the receiving community make a noticeable and documented difference to the sense of belonging of newly arrived migrants and refugees. What hope does it generate for these communities? How does the screening of the digital artifacts that they create mediate their affective geographies and those of their broader social networks? And finally, how do we ensure our research practices center their hopes, stories, and creative agency, even when there are non-migrant interlocutors present. Um, that's the kind of formal part of the talk through this particular project. But in terms of what I'm currently doing on belonging, um, I mentioned an organization called Settlement Services International. That's one of the largest in Australia that works with resettled refu refugees. We don't really have any undocumented or known undocumented migrants per se, because most of our asylum seekers are stuck in offshore detention centers of one kind or another. So the resettled refugees are the ones that organizations like SSI work with and that we can have direct contact with. And SSI has been also really interested in studying belonging because they think there's a lot of work already that exists on what kind of employment and education and housing migrants and refugee ha refugees have access to or get access to, but we don't know enough about what generates a feeling of belonging for them. So this research is in its fourth phase. The third phase on your left here was during the pandemic and it looked at how they were using digital devices and how uh, the fact that the borders were closed and they couldn't reunite with their family members had an impact on their sense of belonging. 
And the most recent phase, which recently concluded and is going to be launched in Sydney on, um, on Monday, so I'm, I have the green light to talk about it, was quite um, innovative in, the, in that it looked at refugee indigenous connections. So you may or may not know that Australia has a First Nations population, um, and we're in the midst of heading towards a referendum which will hopefully give a voice to Parliament to our First Nations people as we don't have a treaty. Um, and in the lead up to that, SSI was really interested in understanding whether refugee populations who are dispossessed themselves feel a, some kind of solidarity with First Nations populations. So most of them indicated through, our, um, through a particular app called Yarn Country, which was literally cultural geography in action because it enabled them to see what the, the indigenous names of the places they were on are and also which places they feel connected to in terms of the natural environment. So the refugees have a great appetite for understanding First Nations issues and also more importantly, it also helps them feel a sense of belonging to the places that they have uh, been resettled in. Um, if you're interested in these reports, I can send you a copy, but you can also look them up online. Um, and in terms of uh, this passage project, I've published a paper in Journal of Youth Studies that looks at the decolonial aspects of the methodology. Um, I'm not cl claiming that it's um, completely decolonial. It's definitely trying to move in that direction. And this paper reflects on that. Um, and the second citation there is for a recent interview that I did with Elaine Swan from University of Sussex that talks about the book and where this interest in belonging came from. And they're both open access as far as I know. And these three uh, pieces here are book chapters, not, that, not as easy to access, so drop me a line if you can't get access to them, but that's sort of part of a broader trajectory of work on uh, refugee films, on refugee media, um, and how it intersects with affect. Again, I'm broadly interested in affect that can create social change and is hopeful um, and sort of trying to move beyond affect that creates negative connotations for refugee and migrant populations. Um, all right. I'm not sure if we can play the films, but um, I'm very, very open to questions and having a longer discussion if that works for everyone. Yeah. That's a great question because my interest in affect started with empathy. Um, so I have a lot to say about empathy and post-colonial approaches. Um, but I would highly recommend the work of Carolyn Pedville. Um, she was one of the first kind of cultural studies scholars to have a critical take on you know, um, ideas of empathy. She recognizes that empathy has been really useful in a number of social movements. But 
dating back to say the speeches of speeches of Obama, like the pre-election spe speeches, and and also the ones to follow, and then again a lot of what happened in the global north subsequent to Obama's election. Um, I guess empathy became a bit of a stopping point in our conversations on social justice or in many social movements, you know, as long, and also with the proliferation of digital media and other kinds of sort of even news media that's 24 seven, empathy also became really transient. So if you look at sort of the, 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 the toddler, Syrian toddler, Alan Kurdi, and you know, how that image res resonated around the world and there was um, this generation of empathy that led to people mobilizing their governments to you know, take in more Syrian refugees, but it was very short-lived. In Australia, for instance, the government decided to increase their intake of Syrian refugees, um, but then you later found out that they were not accepting any Muslim refugees, they were only accepting Christians, so it was very conditional. So what I'm arguing is that um, the, the limitations of empathy as they've become appropriated in this kind of super-mediated neoliberal context, context is that it's, it's, uh, it's transient and it's individualizing um, and it often stops at empathy. It doesn't kind of move into any kind of res taking responsibility or action. So I'd be really keen to understand. I mean, I'm, I'm really keen to always discover um, uh, case studies or examples or projects where it does go beyond you know, that kind of responsibility and taking of action. Um, and a number of the films that were based on refugee issues in Australia after a certain point from, say, the 2000, mid, middle of 2015 to just before COVID hit were having community screenings. And then they had websites, but they were having toolkits where people could do particular things. So I think providing toolkits might be a way to move people beyond just feeling empathy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my really long-winded answer, if that helps. Congratulations for your presentation. My name is Lucio from Brazil. Um, you talk about creating spaces. Mm -hmm. How do you see uh, media can support and could be involved in the creation of these um, spaces? Because somehow we make a video, yeah, what's what's nice? It hypocrites. It, it there's a repercussion, which is also important. Mm -hmm. Visibility, I think, is really important. But how is this idea of a space? I don't know which kind of um, you have been seen in Australia of spaces where media helps to, I don't know, to change the idea of Liverpool, of just a poor mm -hmm. neighborhood, uh, giving not only this different cultural aspect, because we are not uh, Anglo-Saxon and ethnic, mm -hmm. we are different. Oh, they are different, so they are artists, they are, no, everyday people doing everyday things. Mm -hmm. So how do you see this uh, media and space? Um, are you talking about mainstream traditional media or no, all media? Yeah, media. Mm. Like you said, the toolkit. Yeah. Well, traditional media, like in many countries um, that are immigrant countries, is failing, you know, marginalized populations. Um, I talked about Liverpool during the pandemic because the media was particularly notorious. Commercial media, as well as public broadcasters, as well as newspapers on both the left and the right were not really doing a great job of, you know, actually talking to people on the ground and understanding what their problems were and why there was such a high rate of infections. It was just sort of, um, it was scapegoating these parts of Sydney for, you know, what the problems that were going on. Um, so that scapegoating is a big problem uh, with the mainstream media. And some people, I mean, Australia, I guess, is, is different from parts of Europe in that we have a very high population of migrants now. Uh, nearly half of the population was either born overseas or has a parent who was born overseas. So that's a significant proportion. Yet when you look at the, you know, the, the media institutions, the parliaments, the decision-making bodies, you don't really see that diversity reflected. And I know it's kind of a reductive idea of diversity, but even the first kind of basic foundation is not being met. 
So a lot of people who, I guess, have the means and have the privilege of advocating for that kind of change are starting to do that. So, you know, you know if you see um, you know, more people of color in those positions as journalists, as editors, as sub-editors, um, you will see those stories change as far as the mainstream media is concerned, but it's happening very slowly. Um, and as far as digital media, grassroots media is concerned, I think it's happening at various levels, but um, uh, sometimes the campaigns that go viral are, again, really individualized campaigns. Um, to give you an example, there was a Sri Lankan Tamil refugee family called, now famously called the Biluela family, because they were a uh, resident in a town in northern Queensland called Biluela. Um, they were undocumented migrants, um, but their two daughters were born there. And so the local community really wanted them to stay on, even though the visa conditions wouldn't make that happen. So the incoming Labour government promised that if they got in, um, that their family would be granted temporary and eventually permanent visas. And it, it has happened. But the reason it's happened is because there was a really um, kind of groundbreaking viral campaign that crossed, like, crossed party lines that got out to a number of people who were not just refugee advocates and supporters. So good outcome for the family, but not very promising if you think about the, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people that are still um, either waiting in detention or waiting on um, their cases to be heard. So I think the, there's a range of campaigns, but the ones that seem to be successful usually involve children and usually involve, um, you know, advocating for people that on a very individualized basis. So my answer is not very hopeful, but that's what's happened. <laughs> I really like, like your um, idea of belonging as, as something processual mm -hmm. and, and um, relational and, um, and not something predefined, but something that's kind of, kind of uh, uh, process, uh, as a process uh, uh, kind of happening. So uh, you, you connect that to affect, but um, how does that, uh, what does that affect mean in mm. that context? Why not just belonging? Mm -hmm. So I guess you're asking, how is it an emotion? What is it? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. why is affect, uh, or how do you see affect in, in that? Because you, you talked about affective mm -hmm. belonging. Mm -hmm. How is that different from just belonging? Um, I think a lot of people that have written about belonging have written about it um, either as an affect or as a set of practices. Um, those are the two main areas. And I guess what I'm saying is that the practices produce the affect. So I, do, I guess the separation isn't really as clear in what I've observed or in the projects that I've done. So it's almost as though the relationality, the uh, trying to connect to the indigenous land, trying to connect to um, the people from other communities, from other migrant communities who are resident in the same suburb, um, that set of practices is what produces the feeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to problematize the clear separation of the practices from, from the affect and saying the doing creates the affect, uh, or the doing and the living and the, uh, you know, not just interacting with the agencies, the government agencies, but also interacting with, you know, the, the local aspects of where you are is what starts to produce those, those particular embodied feelings. Um, and hence, you know, the relationality and the processual nature of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that's, that's really, really important. And um, of course, having written about solidarity, mm. I, I, I really um, identify uh, by that and, and uh, think that's really important uh, direction. I, I also thought about the case study um, work that you <coughs> you're doing and, and the kind of, there, there are so many participatory workshops that mm -hmm. are happening with, with refugees and migrants and mm -hmm. we've done some of, some of those and, um, and there is often a, quite a lot of critique on them that, that, that they can be superficial or long-lasting mm -hmm. or you know, they are just kind of for, for purposes maybe for 
for the NGOs to mm -hmm. have show impact. Mm -hmm. And how would you say, you know, having done these projects, that what what makes a good participatory project? Oh, that's a long <laughs> list. Um, it's really hard to pin it down, and you're right, there's a lot of critique now, as I said, of core design, of core research, of participatory projects, because uh, in a number of contexts, even if, you have, if, you know, even if you're doing it through a university and you have ethics, ethics committee approval, um, in a lot of these contexts, it becomes more about uh, a one-off consultation. In, this, in the same way that a, what a lot of governments do, they, you know, they hold a community forum, they apparently listen to people, um, but it's the voices of the people are not included. So I think designing the project from the outset in a way where you're already either speaking to the participants or speaking to the stakeholders is really important. Like, it has to be there from the beginning. It can't be a case of, um, you know, you design a project and then you go find the people where you don't have long-lasting, sort of long-term relationships with the community um, so it has to have that element as well of having kind of long-term relationships with the area, with the people um, in the communities, involving the stakeholders, making sure that there's, um, they're designed, they're, they're involved in the design from the, from the beginning. And then I guess it's, uh, it's also about ethics as, as process in a way, and some researchers uh, in the Palestinian context have written about it. Uh, often I think in the university research when we get ethics approval it's almost like a tick box and it's done uh, as long as you get the consent forms and they're signed and so on but this idea of ethics as process especially when you're working with um, you know there's power dynamics in the communities that you're working with is really important to constantly be reflective as a researcher even though you know um, it was more all people of color in terms of the facilitators and the and the students and the refugee participants in this group, you can't ignore the fact that you know, there were power relations involved still. So there was a degree of relatability and cultural safety, but there was still someone in a position of power as a researcher, someone in a position of power as a facilitator, someone finally editing the film. So I think we, we tried our best to be as reflective and conscious to have, to have um, lots of these feedback sessions at the end, not just the questionnaires that you submit um, and, and the participants you know, give them back to you. We actually try to have one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions with them where possible so that, you know, they could, they had a chance to reflect on the project, what they learned from it. Um, and they, at least with the university students, I try to just stay connected with them, give them references, that sort of thing. Um, but not perfect in any way, but I'm, 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 I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that um, there are sort of principles that you can put into practice uh, in, in terms of the design, in terms of how the process involves, how the, how the project evolves, and also what happens at the end where, you know, there is the, the films are screened and that's the end of it, should not be where the project should end. It should have, there should be a really a formal and formal processes of kind of hearing from the participants about how, what, what that helped them do. And in this case, I, I guess I try to reflect it in the talk, um, I think most of them were really surprised that they formed networks outside of their communities um, because it just so happens that when people are studying or when they're just hanging out with their own ethnic communities on the weekend because that's how their parents socialize, um, they, they don't get to form networks outside of that. So I think these participants really valued the opportunity to do that and, and hopefully it helped them in their, in their kind of social, cultural, and um, employment capital. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to talk about this uh, passage between identity and belonging. Um, as we have seen, identity is an old concept mm -hmm. and it underwent several swift mm -hmm. shifts. For example, the performative shift. So it has been stressed that identity is, a pro is something uh, in the making, it's a process, mm -hmm. it's not a fixed category, um, it's decentralized, and so on. Mm -hmm. Why I say this is 
uh, not because I want to have the old concept back, not at all. But um, if we see that we have abandoned this concept of identity because it was captured by the wrong side, mm -hmm. so <laughs> all these identity climbers, um, and uh, what I um, fear, what my question actually is, how could we avoid that the concept of belonging is running in the same pitfall? Mm. So I think that um, <coughs> must be um, have an outcome in, in, a, in a political action. Mm -hmm. So if the social reality does not change, the concept of belonging, I fear, could fail in the future. Mm -hmm. What do you think about I, I completely agree. Um, and I think the reason I've included other concepts like, um, and, 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 and affects like empathy and aspiration in this book are because um, I feel that they, there are times when they, they have been taken up by the other side for different ends. Um, and there, there is a chance that belonging like terms like social cohesion, for instance, be, will become meaningless um, if they're just kind of enshrined in government documents um, but don't really have any resonance with people on the ground. Um, you know, terms like social cohesion, say, in the UK or the Australian context, it's, it's definitely in the multicultural government documents and the frameworks and the reviews and their actual indices that measure them. Um, but in terms of how, if you go and talk to people um, who live in sort of these kinds of areas, uh, it, social cohesion doesn't really have any meaning for them. Whereas I think terms like multicultural or belonging still do. Um, having said that, how long that will last, I don't know. I do think that um, governments have to take more action to change the lived reality in these places. You know, people are not, not going to forget in Liverpool the, the way they were treated during COVID unless the, the local council and the, and the state government makes concerted effort to make sure that, you know, um, that the, 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 the right kind of socioeconomic compensations are in place, a lot of the right kinds of, uh, you know, education, housing, whatever the requirement, requirements of the place are, um, are in place. So, um, and, you know, the new, um, the new set of migrants that come in through the refugee resettlement programs that they get the required services. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, while it's really important to kind of ground belonging in local realities, you're right that the political structures need to... It's important that the political structures don't start, you know, misusing the term um, and not really living up to, you know, what their, their promises or the policies that will generate the belonging. So belonging is not just about, as I said, the reciprocity is important. Belonging is not just about refugees coming in and um, seeing where they can volunteer or seeing which indigenous communities and elders they can connect to. It's also about the receiving community making an effort, not just in terms of, you know, your local shopkeeper being nice to a woman in a hijab, but also, you know, the local councillors, uh, the mayor, the, the relevant MPs and, and uh, ministers, you know, leading the way through their policies and through their behaviour. So that reciprocity, I guess, applies to all levels of government in the receiving society. Thank you so many. I don't know whether I will be able to frame my question properly, but I'm very curious about uh, nostalgia mm -hmm. and its role in this process of belonging. Mm -hmm. And do you also think that there is, uh, you know, people who are caught in the limbo, who yeah. are not able to be, maybe they left their place because they were, the conditions were unlivable or for a better life, mm -hmm. but they're not able to move on. Mm -hmm. And then in this in betweenness, there is this sense of loneliness uh -huh. that's always keeping. Yeah, that's, that's an important question. So this project was like mostly youth participants except for the one uh, Greek-Australian second-generation migrant. And I think with youth, the, you know, we've talked in this conference about the idea of self-actualization. So with youth, the self-actualization, the promise of a better life, the promise of a good life is probably more in the foreground than with people who've spent more time in the home country and have uh, more habituated to whatever they're leaving behind. Um, and in the work that we've done with Settlement Services International, the reports on belonging, I think it does come out that 
you know, older groups of migrants um, are, are probably struggling more, and especially, you know, um, they're waiting for family reunion visas, which are very hard to get by. So if they've got um, family members, in immediate or extended family members, stuck in refugee camps in other countries or in places like Afghanistan where they can't leave now, then their ability to um, let alone feel belonging, to even start you know, feeling like they can make a contribution in the new country is definitely depleted. So that's definitely truer of the older members of uh, refugee families. And there's also gender differences where for women, for instance, uh, who might not be out in the public sphere as much because they've got caring responsibilities or they might not have had formal education. Again, there are additional barriers and there's a greater sense of, I guess, feeling nostalgia um, or feeling like other members, female members of their families are missing during key milestones in their lives. So um, that's important to kind of keep in mind. Yeah, thank you. Okay.